good evening to all the attendees and uh, thank you all for joining this eminent foreign lecture series today so along with me on screen you can see uh, professor dr vishuja chatterjee uh, vice chancellor for university of engineering management jaipur and mr terry l rogers who is the guest and the keynote speaker for today so thanks to uh, vc sir for giving me this opportunity to host this foreign lecture series event once again and i welcome you mr rogers on behalf of the entire iim uem group and wish that today will be another big learning day for all the attendees so before we start the session i'll just take a minute to introduce mr terry rogers terry has over 39 years of progressive experience in critical facilities operations and management including strategic planning critical infrastructure design operations and commissioning business protection and recovery preventive and predictive maintenance technical training and professional training and development and terry is an ashre distinguished lecturer and a voting member of ashre for a very long time and has been working on energy standard and data centers methods of testing for rating computer room air conditioners and commissioning process for data centers he is on the board of directors of building commission associations southeast region and has authored and co-authored many books white papers presentations on critical facilities facilities management and formal commissioning he has developed and taught multiple training classes in design construction operation and maintenance of critical facilities including commercial nuclear plants aerospace facilities and large data centers terry has performed site reliability assessment for more than 45 sites in all over 20 countries and five continents and above all terry writes a bi-monthly column in vision critical magazine called sustainable operations so that was the introduction to mr terry rogers and uh, i'll hand it over to you sir so you can start please okay, well thank you can you hear me yes sir you are audible Excellent. and uh hopefully you can see my screen so um first i'd like to thank you all for this opportunity to speak to you today uh, i'd like to discuss uh, embedding operations and maintenance best practices in the design of critical facilities uh, much of what I say, though, would also apply to any normal type of facility. Uh, it just becomes perhaps more important and more um, more difficult to attain when you, you're designing critical facilities. Uh, let's see. So some learning objectives that we'll, we'll cover today is to learn the importance of including operations and maintenance considerations in the owner's project requirements, the OPR. Uh, it's important to include the O&M management in the design process, and we'll talk about that. Describe the synergies available when developing the facilities management tools during the facility construction. Uh, there's a lot of synergies that become available in tasking the engineers uh, designing the site as well as the construction people on how to help deliver the resources and the documentation etc that's necessary to operate the facility understand how formal commissioning supports the operations and maintenance needs of the facility we'll talk about the commissioning process and, and what that entails uh, describe the types of processes and procedures needed for operations and maintenance, as well as the closeout documentation and training needs. A quick agenda, so to implement best practices for operations and maintenance in facilities. Uh, we're going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, the owner's goal and why operations and maintenance matters. How to embed O&M requirements in the programming and design phases talk about the construction startup testing and commissioning process and how that can uh, provide a lot of the tools and resources needed for the operations of the building. Uh, an O&M staffing and organization discussion on, on the different strategies and ways to, to staff a building or a facility. Uh, what the O&M processes and procedures are that need to be developed and provided by the end of the project. Uh, they should include standard operating procedures, maintenance procedures, and of course, emergency procedures and processes. Quick discussion about BIMS, Building Information Management Systems, and then follow up or fi final finish up, excuse me, uh, with what are the best practices. Uh, so, from the perspective of the owner, the whole point is to build a building or a facility or something that will 
support a mission. And in data centers and mission critical world, that usually equates to a facility that can operate continuously, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, forever, or at least the life of the building without an outage, without an impact to the data center, to the critical uh, infrastructure, and uh, by default to the actual mission of the, the, the facility, what it's trying to accomplish. It could be a bank, it could be um, insurance companies, it could be almost anything, but there's a mission that that facility is designed to, to perform. They want that building to be up and running and reliable on the first day of operation all the way through the end of its life. And, and so you can't wait till the building's been built to start to provision it for operations and maintenance. It needs to be in place when the building is completed. As our facilities get more complex and they have more infrastructure and, and they're, they're, we're seeking to optimize them for um, better efficiencies, reliability, et cetera, uh, the operations and maintenance practices become absolutely paramount. It doesn't matter how well we design and build facilities. If we don't give the operating staff the tools they need, then the performance will degrade over time. You'll have outages and other failures and it'll cost money and, and it costs effort. So it's important to get all this stuff done up front. So we want to embed operations and maintenance strategies and processes and everything into the design and constructions. So we need to start at the programming phase. Typically when you start a project, you would have a programming workshop or some uh, communication between the engineers and the architects and the owner to define what the goals of the project are, what it is you're trying to accomplish, what the mission is, how big the building will be, how many people will be in it, what kinds of rooms, all the functions that you need to have in the building, and you define what the critical and what the physical facility is going to look like. But way too often, we do not consider how the building will be operated and maintained after the building is built and everybody who's designed and constructed it, and constructed it has left. So to do that, we need to include operations and maintenance within the OPR or the, the owner's project requirements document. Uh, the ASHRAE guideline zero actually says the commissioning agent should lead that effort in the programming phase. If not, then you should have your engineer of record perform this, but somebody needs to be asking questions about how the building will be operated and maintained. So you need to define what the O&M, operations and maintenance organization and structure will look like. You need to determine what strategies you'll use. This could be doing everything in-house with direct employees. It could be to outsource it to a, a company that specializes in the operations of facilities, or it could be a combination of the two, which is, is in many cases, you would have maybe the management that's in-house and then have an outsourced labor force. Uh, you need to determine what operations and maintenance processes to employ. Uh, will you be using a computerized maintenance management system, an asset management system? How are you going to manage and track your spare parts and inventory? Uh, your configuration becomes very important, especially when the IT world where you have all the patch panels and all the networking cables and everything, you need to be able to know what's connected to what. Uh, but that can also apply to some of our sophisticated topologies and infrastructure where you have multiple systems that are redundant to each other. You need to know what's online and what's, um, what's supporting what parts of the building, et cetera. Uh, document retention and control is extremely important because you need to have a process that not only maintains the documentation that you need, but updates it when the facility evolves or changes or gets retrofit or upgraded or expanded, and then a way to archive the historical data uh, and only maintain uh, a, an active copy of the accurate and new stuff. <clears throat> and you also need to include in the, op in the programming phase, what kind of training and what kind of certifications will you need to run the building? You need to then carry that process forward into the basis of design, which is typically performed by the engineer of record uh, and the architects. Um, so at this point, 
when they're designing how big the pipes are and how long the wires will be and how large a cooling tower needs to be and all the other things that are the physical attributes of the building, you need to also start defining things like naming conventions and, and identifications for different pieces of equipment or rooms, et cetera. Uh, you need to look at standard labeling and color conventions. And a lot of these facilities, you walk in, when they're properly coded, you can look at a, 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 um, a label on a piece of equipment and that will give you a lot of information. It'll tell you what that system is doing, where it's uh, what the um, where it's fed from electrically. You, you can put a lot of information into the codes if they're thought out in advance. Uh, color coding is extremely helpful, uh, especially when you have duplicate rooms with uh, redundant equipment to make sure that people understand they're in the A side or in the B side, etc. It's surprising how often somebody gets mixed up and opens the wrong breaker thinking he's on plant A and he was actually in plant B and causes an, an unnecessary outage. Uh, maintenance access, transportation routes, et cetera, especially for your largest and most difficult pieces of equipment to, to gain access to, you have to figure out and make sure there's provisions in the design to get that piece of equipment out and replaced. Uh, I've seen a building with on the sixth floor, they had a very large chiller plant with large 880 ton chillers, for instance, and being able to get those chillers in and out of the building was difficult during construction. But once the buildings closed up and the walls were all up and everything, it's very difficult. So we had to have a way to have a knockout in the side of a wall, a way to be able to pick the chillers out and, and through cranes, rig them in and out of the building. Uh, you, you need to have all that planned because you don't want to build a building that you can't replace the equipment in. Uh, define the O&M data collection mechanism. So from here, we're talking about who's going to collect all of the information needed to go into the computerized maintenance management systems, the configuration management system, and all the other things that we just mentioned. Uh, the information is readily available during the construction. Uh, it's not usually so easy to collect after the construction and, and the construction and, and team has left and you just have the facility management people trying to figure it out, nor do they usually have the time to do that. So by deciding in the basis of the design phase, the early design phase, who's going to collect and, and, and compile this information is, is very important. Uh, and then, you, of course, you need to define the operations and maintenance physical needs and space requirements for the building. You need to have a facilities command center. Uh, it has to have the, the building automation system there, but room for files, for drawings, places to, to work. Uh, you need to figure out whether you'll need shops, whether for mechanical or electrical shops, instrumentation and controls place, a carpenter shop, welding, et cetera. And, and what kind of storage needs, which you can include your technical library for your historical data, uh, consumables and, and spare parts, et cetera. Uh, some of these things need to be kept in a secure or, or and or environmentally controlled spaces or else they will, they will degrade before they're, they're needed, before they get used. You have hazardous materials, flammables and, and other types of things. All of this needs to be considered and included into the design. Uh, you need to specify some operations and maintenance conventions and de deliverables and during, in, in the construction document. So once you have a basis of design, you have a strategy, you decide who's going to do what, what needs to get accomplished, then you need to specify that in the actual construction documents so that the contractors are given direction on what needs to be done, who needs to, be, who needs to provide it. They bid this work and then they sign up for it, it goes in their contract, and now you have some, some deliverables that need to be provided uh, by the entities involved, whether it's the engineers of record who have to deliver the as-built uh, record drawings, et cetera, or the, the contractor, general contractor, who has to provide the submittals uh, and, and other things, and including the commissioning agent who has to deliver the test scripts and, and generally the, the systems manuals, et cetera. All of this needs to be um, assigned in the CDs, in the construction documents, so that they become contractually binding and somebody has to deliver it. 
you have to specify the maintenance access, et cetera, in the drawings, actually show where the path is to be able to get the largest piece of equipment in and out of a room, for instance. And in some situations, you can then put these, uh, like if you're required to have three feet clearance in front of a piece of equipment, then on the floor, you can actually have painted or, or a taped or some way of identifying that that area needs to remain clear so people don't stack the equipment or parts or, or stuff in, in those locations. You need to have uh, um, specifications for how things get labeled, especially things that get closed up or uh, are hard to access. Maybe they're up in the ceiling and difficult to see, so a large plaque or something that tells you what's up there. Uh, and show the transportation routes, uh, as I said, to be able to get the equipment in and out of the building. So more things to consider uh, support the operations and maintenance of the building, which would be included in the design, would be like specify emergency lighting. Well, the codes will generally tell you that you have to have sufficient emergency lighting to get people safely out of the spaces and out of the building. Uh, from an operations and maintenance staff, though, when the building goes dark because there's a breaker opens or a power failure or something, rather than exiting the building, generally they're going to the source of where they think the problem is to make corrections, to try to find out why the switch opened or why the power's out. So there are certain rooms that rather than just having a little bit of light, it's better to have the whole room lit up on emergency lighting so that they can go in and, and work safely and resolve problems. So consider the, the lighting requirements uh, in emergency situations. Uh, another thing is to co-locate the storage and spare parts as close to a point of use where appropriate. If it's small little stuff, you keep it in a room anywhere, maybe it's not a big deal. But if you're talking about a 300 pound motor that's gotta be um, rigged and transported and, and, and put into place, uh, it'd be nice if that's actually located close to the point of use, whether it's a pump or chiller or something, rather than having to transport it through an occupied building with the risk of damaging something. Uh, specify as built and closeout documentation, including what we call systems operations and maintenance manuals. These are different from just handing over binders of operations and maintenance manuals from the, uh, from the manufacturers. Uh, systems operations and maintenance manuals are built with the chief engineer, the facility management group in mind. So they're organized by system. They have a constant, uh, I mean, a consistent format uh, and organization and, and content. So maybe you would start with a description uh, narrative of what the system is, and you could have some single line drawings, you could have submittals approved submittals, you could have the procedures, uh, you'd have the O&M manuals from the supplier, you'd have warranties, you'd have all the information for that system packaged up in one place in an easy to use format for the facilities management group. You also want to specify what operations and maintenance training will be required because the, the facility management group needs to be totally trained and able to operate the plant in, in the building on day one, not after the fact, not once everybody's left and come back and, and teach them while the building's already in operation. The training should be site specific. You should define the, where the training will take place. In some cases, it could be a classroom. In other cases, it could be out in the field in front of the equipment. Uh, who will be doing the, the training? How long? The, it needs to cover all of the operating mode, modes and any applicable maintenance procedures. And then, uh, of course, safety and, and, and any kind of certifications or requirements to do the work. We'll get more into to those strategies uh, later in this, this presentation. Uh, I'd like to switch gears a little bit right now and talk briefly about the commissioning process because in my experience, in many of these large projects, uh, especially ones that take you know, a year and a half to three years to build, the facilities management group has not been hired, they've not been identified, they're not available. So somebody needs to take their perspective and ensure that their needs and their, their uh, requirements are, are built into the design, built into the actual facility and delivered at the end of the project. 
often that falls upon the commissioning provider. So the commissioning process, uh, again, I'll refer you to ASHRAE guideline zero, and there are other guidelines within ASHRAE that are, that are absolutely um, some of the best documentation you can find to describe the commissioning process, including standard 202, the commissioning process. Uh, basically says that the commissioning is the first guy in, you should hire him, he should hope with the, help with the programming phase, and he's the last one out because he will be there doing all the final testing, making sure the closeout documentation is provided in the training, and then often he has to come back and, and do uh, deferred testing and warranty uh, inspections, et cetera. So the commissioning provider is the first person you hire and the last one to leave. The commissioning provider should ensure that the owner's project requirements are formally documented. And that means that there's an OPR and that it has all of the overarching and high level requirements and goals that the project's trying to attain. He then ensures that the engineer's basis of design is, com is complies with the OPR, that it addresses all the needs and all the goals and all of the stipulations that came out of the OPR, that the strategy and the basis for how they're going to build the building are, meets those requirements. Then he, the commissioning provider will review the commissioning documents, the drawings and the specifications, and ensure that they're addressing what the basis of design was saying it would do and that it all reflects on the OPR uh, and, and addresses all the needs. Now that the, the design is complete, the, uh, well, it's before the design is complete, as part of the CDs, the commissioning provider needs to also ensure that the commissioning requirements are built into those CDs. So that includes a division one general commissioning specs often written by the commissioning provider, it includes making sure that the major trade and equipment specifications have the uh, commissioning requirements built in. So whether they'll be tested with load banks, who has to provide fuel for the generators, uh, who has to participate in the various testing, uh, all of the other things that go into the commissioning need to define. Uh, and of course, also that the testing, uh, the acceptance testing, which we just mentioned, but also the closeout documentation, the systems operations and maintenance manuals that I just mentioned, as well as uh, the training requirements are all programmed in and are included in the, the construction documents. Then the commissioning agent will verify and validate that the construction and startup of the equipment is compliant with the CDs, with the construction specifications. And then we'll actually do the performance testing. So when everything's been started and the contractors all say that the building is ready to be tested, to be run, to be operated, then we go out and we do all the functional testing of the equipment. Uh, and we make sure that the actual facility operates uh, according to the OPR. The, a lot of that data becomes your baseline data that retained by the facilities management group so they can see how the building operated when it was commissioned, when it was first turned over to them, which will help them track how the building performs over the long haul over time. Also within the commissioning process, as I've mentioned, is to document that the built facility and the O&M requirements are done. So the as-built closeout documentation and to ensure that the O&M staff get, uh, get trained. And some of the best training they'll ever get is to participate in the commissioning where they actually see it getting built, they see it getting tested and they, they see how everything works. So the commissioning strategy is actually pretty simple is to identify and resolve issues and discrepancies as early as possible to minimize the impact on the schedule, on resources, on your budget, and on quality. So how do we do that? How do we identify and resolve issues early? Is first, we look at factory acceptance tests, identify problems before things leave the factory. And with critical facilities, often we embellish what the manufacturer typically does with its testing, and we have them do additional tests that are more specific to our application. And in a lot of cases for critical facilities, for larger and more complex equipment like the large chillers, the UPS, uninterruptible power supplies, 
uh, and other large pieces of equipment, uh, emergency generators, will actually go to the factory and witness that testing and ensure that it's correct before it leaves the factory. On arrival, when it shows up at the site, somebody needs to ensure that it wasn't damaged during shipping, that it's the right equipment that was shipped, that it has all the ancillaries and bells and whistles that were bought with it, that the documentation comes with it, et cetera. Uh, and so we make sure that all that stuff is done so that when you go to install it, you know that the equipment is correct, it's, it's ready, it wasn't damaged, et cetera. We do systems construction verification. So over the course of building facility, we look at the installation, the means and methods, make sure that it's, it reflect, it's, it's complying with the construction documents, et cetera. And then we witness the startup and energization the first time you put power to equipment. And we make sure that the manufacturers and the installing contractors go through the startup routines and make sure that the equipment is, is working properly and safely before we turn it over for the functional testing. So we do the functional testing to identify any problems before we get to testing the interfaces between systems. So generally in functional testing, you start with the simple, with the components and maybe the equipment level, and then you test them as a system. And then you finally test the systems interrelated with each other, which is what we call integrated systems testing. And when everything's been functionally tested and everything seems to be working properly, we usually end up with what we call a pull the plug test where we would kill power to the entire facility outside of the site, uh, maybe by the utility opening up their feeder breakers to the site, and then watch that the building responds appropriately, that the emergency generators start, that the UPS has carried a load during the, the power outage, that the chiller plant restarts and that the building is able to survive the outage without any impact to the mission. Another commissioning strategy is regarding documentation. Develop your site-specific as-built documentation during construction and use this data collection process to populate the O&M programs. So we talked about the computerized maintenance management system, the asset management system, the spare parts and all that other stuff. So establish a template and collection mechanisms early. If you have a CMMS system, then you should have input forms that you put in the serial number, model number, and you define the equipment and what you're gonna do. All that data is needs to be collected and put into the system. By having the templates and all of that process defined early, you can assign that to the general contractor, for instance. So when he makes a submittal or uh, for a piece of equipment, he can already start filling out those pieces, uh, those information into those forms and start to populate the CMMS system in advance. Uh, enforce the collection and development and delivery of the documents uh, during the delivery, installation, and testing of the equipment and systems. Uh, require the contractors to collect and deliver most, if not all, of this information uh, and, and this could include um, the commissioning agent also providing startup forms and completed test scripts. All this stuff can be compiled and done during construction and then use the, the functional testing and integrated systems testing to, to develop your standard operating procedures because they're, they're almost uh, the, the procedure, uh, the test procedure can almost be used as an operating procedure in some cases. You need to change the formatting and some of the other stuff that goes into it but the step-by-step -step process has basically been defined and deliver all of this in what we call the systems operations and maintenance manuals. Another commissioning strategy is to perform the operations and maintenance staff training during construction. Again, um, the staff needs to be fully trained and, and proficient in how to operate and maintain the building on day one when it first goes live. So they, the training program needs to be designed and implemented during the construction. So during the, the programming phase, we talked about, we're gonna define who the staff is, what their roles and responsibilities are. In the basis of design, we decide how the training will be provided. Uh, generally, it's some 
suppliers do some of their generic training on their pieces of equipment, and it needs to be supplemented with some site-specific training showing how these pieces of equipment are being configured and operated on this particular site. So you should hold what we call a training workshop and you would get the owner and the, the, somebody from the facility management group, if they exist, to, to attend. You would have the general contractor and the engineer of record, and you'd go through and decide what needs to be trained, how it's gonna be phased, uh, what gets trained first, second, third, uh, and then you develop a training plan. You figure out what training materials and where it will be held, what instructor qualifications are needed, uh, and then you put this into your master construction schedule. The idea is to have the academics taught the, the, the narratives, the sequence of operations, uh, the purpose, the capacities, anything in, in a classroom setting where it's quiet, people are focused, you have uh, whiteboards or projectors, et cetera, and you can, you can cover all of the information on the academic side. And then you reinforce that by having separate training on the same systems uh, during the functional testing. And then at this point, they're taking the information gained in the academics and they're actually seeing with their hands and, and their eyes and seeing how the equipment actually works. And, and they can see during the functional testing, the emergency procedures and how we configure it for maintenance, et cetera. Uh, and it's extremely helpful for them. Um, it can include corporate and administrative training by the owner. So the, the owner may be hiring new staff. So part of their training program could actually include uh, any uh, onboarding and, and security and other types of processes they need to, to know, and then how they need and, and include that with how they're gonna actually operate the specific building. Uh, so again, I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about complexity versus efficiency versus reliability. And I'm going to give a little example story, a real life story that, that happened to me to, to emphasize this point. Um, the data center industry has been struggling with uh, energy consumption for years. And as our demands for energy increase and the electric bills get higher, the carbon footprint grows uh, and everybody's becoming more and more concerned with efficiency, then uh, the data center industry has, has been in pursuit of energy efficiency now for over a decade or more. It really came to light when it became evident that the IT equipment being the servers and, and computers uh, we're using more, we're costing more in the electricity to power them over their expected life of three to four years than the devices actually cost. So you pay $5,000 for a server and you'll end up paying $7,000 or $10,000 in electric, electricity in four years to power that server. So the the everybody started worrying about energy and they started measuring it with uh, what's called power utilization effectiveness uh, and then we started picking all the low-hanging fruit so we started using hot and cold aisles and blanking panels uh, and brush strips to make sure that we, the cold air was where we needed it and the hot return air was was not mixing with it uh, and then we went after the mid-level fruit and we started using hot aisle containment retrofitting equipment with variable frequency drives and ECM uh, electronically commutated motor fans, et cetera. We started applying rack level temperature control and, and all these other things. And, and we're now using free cooling and economizers almost everywhere, both air side and water side. So the manufacturers in their pursuit of trying to get uh, incremental improvements in efficiency have started to make their components and their equipment more and more complex. They've added more and more capabilities, more and more control settings, et cetera. So some examples are what we call a computer room air handler, uh, which is a fan coil, and a computer room air conditioner, which is simply a, a glorified air conditioner. It's a DX unit, direct expansion unit with compressors, uh, 
They're basically the same devices we've been making for decades. Rely on the controls to make them reliable. And we rely on the setup and configuration, configurations, excuse me, to make them efficient. We've been doing this technology for, for, for a long time, but the newer products now each have a new improvement, a new bell, a new whistle, a new capability, something that, that they, their competition doesn't have. Everybody's trying to one up each other. New versions of these simple pieces of equipment now have settings and, and configuration options that require multiple layers of menus and submenus in their onboard controllers. There's no obvious correct setup instructions. I've read the manuals. I've, I've been, I've seen them. Uh, there's many of the pieces of the, um, excuse me, many of the options and the settings and configurations depend on the type of unit you bought. So they have a generic controller they put on it, but then you have to configure it for whether it's an upflow unit or downflow, whether it's going to have uh, local sensors that are integral to the box or whether you've put remote sensors out somewhere in the space. These kinds of things uh, all can be accommodated, but somebody has to set up the equipment appropriately. And many are dependent on just plain user preference and operating strategies. Are you going to have one unit on and if it fails, it starts another unit? Or are you going to have both units running at part load? Are you going to control to relative humidity or to dew point? All of these things need to be decided and, and, and programmed into the units. So my real life experience. I was on a project, it was a very small data center, more of a server room, it only had two crack units in it. They were dual source, so each crack had the combination of a fan coil as well as a DX unit built into it. DX was primary and the uh, coil, the water coil was considered an economizer coil. In our case, we plugged the economizer into a chill water plant, so actually it was available 99.9% .9 of the time. Each crack unit had an integral controller. There was a separate controller on the wall that managed the two units together as a team so they could share set points and wouldn't fight with one in heating, one in cooling, etc. And then you had a building management system, which also had some basic control capability. They could control set points, so they could rotate equipment, etc. You know, the lead lag, that kind of thing. During commissioning, when we were doing the functional testing of these pieces of equipment. It became very apparent to me, I was there watching, that nobody in the room actually understood all the intricacies, all of the complexities of the control systems. It was new technology for the client. He'd never seen this before. The engineer of record focused on the sizing and the capacities and, and the layout and, and how to, to, to use the equipment, but he didn't understand all the intricacies. The mechanical contractor who installed it understood everything about the installation, but had never operated it before. And the person we really relied on the most, the manufacturer's technical represent representative, I think he was very familiar with a standard crack unit and very capable with a cray unit, but this combined dual source unit was something he very rarely saw. And he was just leaving a lot of the settings in, in the factory default, the way they showed up. The commissioning test group had been vetted through the entire team. Everybody said it was good. Uh, no comments back. When we were executing the test group, it became apparent that uh, it wasn't working the way we thought. And the manufacturer's tech rep, technical rep started trying to troubleshoot it. And, and it seemed like just a trial and error manner. He was just trying things to see what would work. Eventually, the system did what it was supposed to do. Uh, we all signed off and said it was completed. Uh, the O&M staff was given some basic training so they could change set points, the lead lag assignments, maybe do filter changes, et cetera, but basic training. We all left, everything was considered complete. And several months later, I got a phone call that the system had failed and the computer room had overheated. And they wanted to know what happened and why it passed commissioning and yet failed in operation. So I ended up calling in the manufacturers, national gurus, the people who actually wrote the programming and, and the manuals for this equipment. They came in and did a root cause analysis, checked everything out and basically said, the units are perfectly fine. They did exactly what they were programmed to do. They were just set up and programmed incorrectly. 
The owner's reaction was to disable all the unnecessary ancillaries and options and everything that wasn't important to just doing cooling and basically removed all of the energy efficiency capabilities and, and everything, disabled all of the, the ancillaries that weren't necessary and turned these units back into the same fan coil and DX unit that we've been making for decades. Uh, the moral of the story is to keep it simple usually results in reliability and sometimes efficiency. Right size your complexity to match the O&M staff capability. If you have very basic staff with very basic understanding, don't hand them extremely complex systems without uh, the training, whatever they need to be able to manage that equipment. A basic narrative sequence of operations is, can be inadequate, in, especially when you have to interpret that into the programming in the BMS system or into the controls to make sure that the equipment gets set up and optimized in accordance with the designer's intent. Uh, and then bottom line is that manufacturers want to upsell. They want you to buy all of the ancillaries, all the add-ons, all the extras, everything they can sell you. More is not always better. So one more time, switch gears. I'm gonna talk now about the operations and maintenance organization and staffing. Remember that a lot of this needs to be already thought through when you go into the programming phase because it will influence how you design and test and train and, and, and the type of deliverables that the facility maintenance staff will need. So one thing I recommend is in a data center is to organizationally eliminate what we call the silos. The silos being the facilities management group is completely independent of the IT group and other divisions. You need to recognize the mutual dependence of the IT group and the facilities group and have them work to common goals and objectives. So if they work under the same umbrella with the same staff, and not staff, but, but the same overarching management, and reporting structure, uh, and they work together as teams, then there's a much better outcome. This will eliminate the competition for staff and for money. Uh, it puts everybody in the, in the same uh, goals. Um, you wanna co-locate and combine the IT, uh, NOC, being the Network Operations Center, basically the command center for managing the data center uh, IT, the computers, the networking, all that, co-locate that with your facilities command center. So that if there's an anomaly uh, on the infrastructure side, the IT people will immediately know, they'll know where it is, what's at risk, and they can do what they can on the IT side to mitigate any possible problems that might occur. Uh, and likewise, if the IT side starts to have problems, whether servers overheating or some other problems, they can immediately communicate with the facilities group and find out what's going on and see what can be done to maybe help them. This is fostering collaboration and planning, including work scheduling. You'll find that the load and capacity tracking needs to be a combined uh, effort uh, since the IT group is essentially the load and the facilities management is the capacity to cool and, and to power the load uh, trending and all the other things. You need to cross train where you can to the appropriate level, the staff, so that the, the IT group that's deploying servers and, and networking gear understand the needs of the facilities management group with regards to providing cooling and power and all that kind of stuff and vice versa. Uh, develop a workflow process for deploying IT assets that includes incorporating the facilities needs. So when you go out and put in more computers, somebody needs to go out and add cooling. Somebody has to make sure that the power is off of both A and B so that you're protected, et cetera. So first thing you need to do when you want to start organizing and staffing a new building, new facility, uh, and as I said, this should occur during the programming phase, is start with a job analysis. You list all the tasks, all the, the things and activities that are required to operate and maintain the site infrastructure. And then you identify which of those pertain to critical facilities, because not everything that goes on, even in a critical facility, is just critical. You have, you know, um, 
you have a lobby VAB box, and that's not critical compared to a centrifugal chiller that's cooling the data center plant. So you need to identify what's critical and not critical. Uh, and then you have to decide who's going to do what. Are you going to have a single staff that does everything, or are you going to have a critical staff that's focused on the mission critical infrastructure, and then a non-critical staff that can do uh, the, the other types of things common in any commercial uh, building? You need to decide if you're going to have operations versus maintenance staff, or everyone does both. Again, are you going to have operators who go around and, and operate the building and when they encounter a problem they would call a maintenance technician to come out and do it and the maintenance people would also do the preventive maintenance and the other types of maintenance routine maintenance that goes with the building or you're going to have one one set of staff that does both they operate and they maintain the equipment will you have trades like mechanics and electricians and plumbers and a controls tech or are you just going to have a single staff again where everybody does everything and the reason these things are very important is because it's going to determine how many people you have, uh, whether you're going to do the work in-house or you're going to outsource it. So where you need spare parts and everything else. Um, and also the training. Uh, if everybody's a jack of all trades and everybody does the same thing, you need one training program. If you're going to separate it out into different trades, then everybody has to have some core training and then you would have specialized training for a mechanic and specialized training for an electrician, et cetera, and not everybody would get the same thing. You create these task descriptions and group them by requisite skills and knowledge. So basically you're building the uh, position descriptions. So you group the tasks that you came out of the job analysis into various positions. Uh, based on the definitions we just gave, whether it's jack of all trades or whether we're going to have uh, operations versus maintenance, et cetera. And then you divide, decide how to staff each of these positions. So it's going to be a direct employee. Are you going to bring in an in-house contractor? Are you going to use service level agreements and call in uh, outside contractors on an on-call or as needed basis? Or in many cases, it's going to be a combination of all of those, depending on the type of work. Develop an organization structure. And as I mentioned earlier, you need to start with an enterprise level organization and then develop the facilities organization. Again, identify your critical versus non critical staff. Look at any shift coverage. How many people do you need a full complement of people 24 hours a day, or do you have certain people available only during the, the, the day and then a a uh, small crew at night or weekends, et cetera. Uh, and then define any maintenance windows or freezes. Uh, like for instance, uh, some businesses will not allow any critical work to occur on holidays or, or on important reporting days, et cetera. Um, and then include the who's going to maintain the the procurement systems, your work approvals, the computerized maintenance management system, what kind of administrative help do you need? And how are you going to communicate with other departments? From that, you now develop the operations and maintenance department mission. Uh, you should have a mission statement, uh, create a strategic plan with clear and measurable goals and objectives so that you have a way to measure how well you're performing as you operate and maintain the building. You can refer to ASHRAE TC 9.9 thermal guidelines. You can refer to corporate standards. Uh, you could uh, use uh, service level agreement uh, requirements, et cetera, but you need to have some objective means to determine whether the building is being operated and maintained correctly. And then, in general, you need to develop the policies first, then develop the processes to implement the policies, and then finish with the procedures that would define the step-by-step -step, uh, process to, to, to complete the process, I mean, procedures to complete the process. So basically, your policies are the rules, such as who can do what, when can things get done, who has to approve it, et cetera. The processes are, are your tools to implement those policies, an example being change control. You don't just go out and start um, swapping chillers or 
putting a UPS into bypass, et cetera, without approvals. And that needs an entire change control process, which would include uh, advanced scheduling, getting approvals, notifying the IT group, make sure there's no problems or, or other things that, that need to be addressed that would preclude you from being able to do the work safely, et cetera. Uh, and then once you've got that in place, you develop the actual procedures to go out and do something like put the unit in bypass or the swap equipment over, et cetera. A lot of times they're referred to as methods of procedures or MOPs. So first develop and implement the operations processes. Uh, you need the work authorization, who's going, who, who, what, what approvals do you need to go out and execute the work? You should include routine inspections and shift tours, the things that are done every single day and, and how that information is recorded. Uh, if there's an anomaly or a problem, how that gets uh, recorded and, and addressed. Uh, if there's serious problems that they get escalated. Um, double verification of buddy systems. You can do try runs and practice drills. Um, we use simulators in some cases to practice procedures before we go out and execute them in the field. Uh, you need status boards or mimic panels that keep the configuration up to date so that as you have a shift change and new people come on, they know what happened during the last shift. They know what systems are supporting what. They know of any uh, anomalies or outages or something that's failed during the previous shift. Um, you need to have lockout and tagout and other valve switch uh, processes. Uh, on how you will um, maintain safety and, and of not only the people, but also the equipment systems. Shift turnover process, so that as one shift leaves and the next one comes on, they get all the status updates and everything. Uh, and of course, you have to have your safety and your hazardous material and other safety-related processes defined. Once you have the processes defined and in place, then you can develop the actual procedures or what we call standard operating procedures. Uh, they should use a standardized format, organization, name and conventioning. Uh, they need to be controlled so that they're updated as systems change. You need to know who's been trained on them so that you know who's qualified to do the work. Uh, they should, the standardization means that anybody who picks up a procedure will already know that at first I'll see the approvals and I'll see some prerequisites and I'll see some safety things, then I'll see uh, the tools necessary, then I'll see the actual procedure, then I'll have the contingency on how to react if something goes wrong, and then I'll have the back out and the close out procedure to make sure that when the work is completed, we restore it back to operations and, and use. Uh, safely, et cetera. So all that needs to be consistent regardless of what system or procedure you're picking up. Um, avoid vague and generic language. Uh, each should be specific to a building and equipment. Um, categorized by motors or situations. So you need normal and routine procedures, uh, preparatory or special situations, such as a, a storm watch, if you know a, a bad storm is coming, or if you know that there's going to be an outage, or, or a flood is a, a possibility, et cetera. So you go out and prepare your site accordingly. And of course, emergency re and recovery procedures for when things do blow up or fail or whatever. Uh, include the appropriate prerequisitions and cautions. Um, the permissives, uh, things like safety considerations, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, the procedure should not only say what step you should take, but also what the expected outcome is. So that if you don't see that outcome, you know that something's gone wrong and you need to stop the procedure and assess where you're at. Uh, for instance, you could say, you know, open the breaker uh, and you should see a green light, you open the breaker, but you don't see a light, what do you do? Uh, do you stop? Do you try to replace the light bulb? Do you just keep going? You check with the BMS to see if it's open. I mean, there, you need to, to have clear direction, not only on what to do, but what happens when things don't work accordingly. They should be step-by-step, step, uh, as I said, with the expected results. Keep it clear and simple. Often a flow chart is better than a lot of words and step-by-step and -step procedures because a flow chart basically uh, steers you uh, through it. You can add digital photos and other things to, you know, where a 
a picture is worth a thousand words, et cetera, uh, and include any closeout checklist. Like I said, it's important to make sure that they're restored to work to, uh, to use appropriately. Very similar process for maintenance processes. Again, you want to establish the approval process. Uh, uh, you want to use computers and software programs and mobile technologies to the extent that you can. So a lot of times now, uh, and this will relate back to the BIMS discussion we'll get to a little bit, but you can put a barcode or a Q card, Q code or, or some, some identification on the equipment and then have the CMMS system programmed into a tablet and a technician can go up, he can do a scan of the barcode. It would bring up the uh, associated drawings and documentation, but also the maintenance procedure. Uh, he can then go through it. This can be tied into your asset management system, your configuration management systems, et cetera, all the other things. Uh, and for computerized maintenance management systems, it should include corrective maintenance, which is basically run to failure or, or no maintenance. Uh, preventive maintenance, where you go out and do things on a timetable, like replacing uh, filters every six months or, or checking belts or, or things. Uh, predictive maintenance, where you actually uh, trend the condition of equipment over time. And then you can predict failures because you can see the degradation. This would include vibration analysis, IR, uh, infrared scanning, also called thermography, tribology, which is oil analysis, uh, laser alignment, computerized balancing, et cetera, and generally a combination of all of the above. So there's certain pieces of equipment, like for instance, a $100 <coughs> uh, bathroom exhaust fan. You could spend thousands of dollars doing maintenance on that when if it fails, it's no big deal. You would just replace it. Uh, so that's where run to failure might actually make sense. And then you other have other pieces of equipment uh, where if they failed, it would, could be catastrophic to the mission. And that's where you'd want to do the full predictive maintenance and, and do everything you can to ensure that stuff is, is safe. <coughs> you, uh, another important thing is to include in your maintenance process is an ability to capture data uh, for history, but also that that data is reviewed and assessed and analyzed over time. It's not good enough just to keep collecting data and archiving it away, uh, making sure that things are okay and that they're within specifications. It's more important or as important to trend that data over time and see how things are starting to degrade or to see that this one piece of equipment, you might have five pieces that are identical and one keeps failing more often than the others. These, these histories can help you in making sure that you're approaching the maintenance uh, the best you can. Once you have the procedures, I mean, excuse me, the processes in place, again, you develop the maintenance procedures. Very similar to the uh, standard operating procedures. They should be specific to each equipment or system. Uh, consider frequency, seasons, et cetera. Um, some stuff's done daily. You have weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly uh, procedures. Um, Springtime is a good time to prepare for summer. So uh, if you know it's going to be a hot summer, then during the easy season, you would do the, the chiller overhauls and everything and make sure that they're ready before you roll into the summer. Uh, and similar for, for boilers and heating equipment, you would do that in the fall in preparation for the winter. Uh, you want to include prerequisites, uh, approvals, cautions, et cetera, like I said, similar to SOPs. And in one case, a simple thing that gets overlooked sometimes is to make sure before you start working on a piece of equipment that the redundant piece of equipment is healthy, available, and is, is, has no problems. Um, so you don't uh, back yourself into a, a hole. Uh, include step-by-step -step directions on how to isolate the security equipment to make sure that the rest of the facility is not jeopardized. Uh, you include acceptance criteria include access considerations, uh, what you, know, uh, you need to have a ladder, uh, include what kind of uh, consumables you would need, uh, include the ability for technicians to take notes. Again, this goes back to the histories. Uh, take photos of things that are failed, add comments, uh, put readings that would be trended, 
et cetera. And include the closeout checklist again, very important to make sure equipment that's taken out of service is returned back to service correctly. Um, finally, we get to emergency processes. Um, first thing I want to talk about with emergency processes is that you really need to think of them in, in two different categories. The first is in some cases, it's important to act first and notify later. An example would be an uninterruptible power supply uh, that goes into battery run mode. So when the battery is run out, the load's going to fail. It's going to fall, uh, you're going to have a mission impact. The clock's ticking. But in this situation, there's no personnel risk. There's no safety risk. So the right action is to immediately try to, to correct the problem with the UPS uh, and, and, be, and get it done before the battery runs out of life and you have a mission impact. The other case is when it's important to notify first and act later. Another easy example would be a small fire uh, in a trash can or something like that. The rule should be to call for help first and then grab the fire extinguisher. Why? Because if you get overcome by the fire, then nobody's coming to help you. So the first thing you do is call for help and then you act uh, and do what you can to, to mitigate the problem. Uh, don't let small emergencies cascade into larger emergencies. An example that I know of was a site where it was a large critical data center, very large one uh, for a large healthcare organization. And they had a chiller plant failure. All of the chillers stopped working uh, and the data center was, was at risk of overheating uh, without cooling. The facilities told the IT group that they could resolve it and, and to keep running. Don't shut down, we're gonna fix it. Uh, they didn't get it fixed in time. The servers started to shut down on thermal overload, meaning they were overheating. The site finally declared an emergency and, and shut down all the IT equipment. The chiller plant was restored, the data center was restarted, and lo and behold, 40% of those servers either failed to restart or had degraded performance. If the building had done an EPO, an emergency power off, when the data center, when the chill water plant had first shut down and it became evident it may not be able to restart quickly, then they could have protected the IT equipment. They would still have an outage, it would have still been an impact to their mission, but they could have restored that building within hours, maybe a day or two. Instead, they had to go find thousands of new servers, which they didn't have on the shelf, or the suppliers didn't even have them. And so it took over a month before that building was restored back to full operations. So develop your emergency procedures. Again, a standard format, but in this case, they don't necessarily look like the operating procedures and the, the standard operating procedures, normal procedures, or the maintenance procedures. Emergency procedures, for one thing, need to be uh, very concise. Uh, they should be located at the place of use. So you don't want to go pull, have to go to the command center to find an emergency procedure. It should be at the chiller or the UPS unit or the generator. It should be laminated or some other means so that you can take notes right on it with a grease pencil or something like that. Um, they need to be uh, concise uh, and simple uh, because in an emergency, you really don't want operators having to interpret or to, uh, to overthink things. They should really be in a mode of taking action. So you wanna have very clear direction on what they need to do. Uh, and of course, these procedures need to be uh, trained. They should do dry runs and, and they should practice these procedures. Uh, and, and they should be as realistic um, as possible. I know uh, some mission critical sites that once a year will do a pull the plug test. They will literally kill the power to the building and watch that the building operates correctly. And they do that as both training for their staff and retraining. They do it to ensure that the building will respond and work in a controlled manner when, when they have all their contingencies in place and they can back out if something goes wrong. And they do it just to prove to themselves and, and to ensure that the equipment in the building is reliable. Um, a final thought, 
uh, various studies have confirmed that most mission impact events are associated with human activities, whether switching, rotating equipment, uh, installing new equipment or something, and that the majority of these impacts are actually associated with human error. Uh, I've heard as high as 80% of mission impacts are associated with people, with 70% being human error. Standard operating procedures, methods of procedures, maintenance procedures, emergency procedures help to minimize these impact events. So quickly about building information modeling systems or management systems. Uh, they've been around now for, for at least a decade. Uh, products have progressed from their beta, beta or test phase into you know, proven mature products that are available. They use databases to electronically link data, records, documents, specifications, drawings, uh, et cetera, in a common database with links so that you can get from one piece of data to another. Uh, you can go in and, for instance, and click on, on a CAD drawing on a, on a piece of equipment, and it would bring up the original specifications, the warranties, um, operating procedures, you name it. It basically links a lot of these databases together. Um, they can link the construction documents to your, your computerized maintenance management system, et cetera. Uh, BIMS, as well as these other processes, um, require pre-planning and a lot of resources to implement and to maintain them, but especially to develop and implement them. It takes a different skill set to develop these things, these processes, than to actually use them. It takes more effort to develop them than to use them. And the O&M staff may have neither the skills nor the time once the site goes live to build these systems. So it's important for us to get them built and delivered and in place before the facilities management team comes on. So what is the best practice? The O&M best practice for a given owner and a facility depends on many and sometimes competing variables uh, and preferences, et cetera. And there really are few absolute right or wrong solutions. Uh, in general, you need to right size your solution to the need and to the, the staff. What is critical to, to success is to clearly establish the goals and objectives to define the needs and the requirements to meet those goals and objectives, to select the appropriate strategies and solutions to be able to meet the needs and then stick to the plan. Uh, way too often uh, people uh, start to deviate or defer or just don't follow through uh, and so they don't get the outcome they want. So the most important best practice of all is to execute in a high quality manner. To, to allocate the resources, to get the, the right expertise in place, uh, to put the effort necessary to do a, a high quality job. And that is my presentation. Um, I welcome any questions and, uh, or comments. Uh, you have my, my contact information there, which includes my email address. I welcome inquiries or, or, or comments or, or questions. In, in, even after this presentation. Uh, I, I put this, this um, quote at the bottom here uh, because it's something that stuck with me. I actually was um, fortunate enough to give a presentation at the Valor Institute of Technology uh, in, in Valor, India uh, a year or two back. And they have plaques of famous people and sayings throughout their campus. And this one, this one really caught me because I believe it, it, it talks to the mission critical world. Uh, it is from Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General. And it says, building culture of prevention is not easy. While the cost of prevention had to be paid in the presence, it benefits lying in the distant future. Moreover, the benefits are not tangible. They are disasters that did not happen. And when you're talking about critical facilities and an outage can cost you millions and millions of dollars per hour, uh, and not only that, but in some cases it's life safety or national security or, or businesses that can then fail. Uh, it is very important that we exercise and, and, and put out the effort necessary today 
to ensure that that building is optimized and reliable in the future after everybody else has left. And that's it. Here we are. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So, Professor Gurnani, uh, I believe you are there. Yes, I am there. Okay. So, you may kindly uh, read out the questions that were uh, presented to you. Okay. Uh, so, so the first question which I can see in the uh, question box is that uh, what does the tra uh, uh, transportation and scheduling uh, like? How does the transportation and scheduling affect working operations in data centers? Um, you were a little bit garbled. I'm not sure I, I really heard that question. Please repeat it. So, like, how does the transportation and the scheduling effect working operations in data centers? How does the documentation affect? Yes. I'm sorry. I'm just. It's a little bit garbled. I'm having a little bit of a problem hearing. So, uh, actually, the question is. How does the transportation and scheduling affect working operations in data centers? Uh, so transportation, if 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 I understand the question, my my reference to transportation was transporting equipment, materials, uh, and and parts and equipment through the facility. Um, I've seen a building where you could not get a pump out of there were three pumps and one of them was located where you would literally have to take another pump out just to access a particular pump so maintenance access things like that uh, trying to get a piece of equipment out is generally pretty easy because you can cut it up into pieces and remove it but you need to have sufficient path and means to get large pieces of equipment from the loading dock all the way through a building into a space. Uh, and if that space is surrounded by mission critical equipment that cannot be taken down, uh, then you, you need to have uh, ways to be able to move that equipment safely, uh, not just safely for the people, but safely for the surrounding equipment and infrastructure. It, did that answer the question? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take up the second question, sir. Uh, can you please elaborate with an example about the site-specific training requirements for O&M facilities? Sure. Um, so one way to look at it is is what we need is trained operators and maintenance technicians who are competent to be able to do the job. So it's not like they can be 70% good enough. You, you can't do 70% of your job correctly and 30% is not right. And so you really have to look at it as a pass fail type of a training and certification. You can either do the job or you can't. Uh, and so what, it's what we call performance-based training as opposed to academics. So academics, you go in and you teach um history or something and then you you would develop a test and, or quiz or something and then you would try to test people to see if they picked up on the, on the information how much they retained and they might retain 60 70 80 percent whatever and they get a grade with performance-based training um, instead what you do is start with the test you would actually build the test the certification what it takes to prove that somebody is capable of doing the job. He's, he's proficient, he's either qualified, he can do it right, or he can't. Then you develop the training materials to get him to pass the test. And so before you can do that though, you need to know who am I teaching? Is this somebody who's um, maybe a high school or is it a, a has he had some technical training or is it, I mean, what is the starting point? Uh, so that you know what prerequisites you assume they already have before they show up. And then uh, starting from there, what skills and knowledges do you have to train so that they can pass the test, which proves that they can do the job. So it's a, it's a completely different um, approach 
to training than your typical academics. The other thing to consider is that manufacturers have canned or, or um, routine training programs that they offer for their equipment. So if you buy a centrifugal chiller, you can buy uh, some training where somebody would come out and they would teach you how that chiller works, how to set it up, how to change set points, uh, what maintenance it needs over time, et cetera. But that's all they'll teach you. They don't know how that chiller supports your facility. They don't know where the power's coming from. They don't know uh, what types of air handlers or terminal units are out there. Uh, they don't know anything more about that chiller than, than the chiller itself. So that, chain, that, that can be very good training, but it needs to be supplemented with some site-specific training where somebody says, okay, the purpose of that chiller is to cool the following. It needs to run seven by 24. We have redundant chillers, so you need one out of two or two out of three. You need to, uh, the power is fed through an automatic transfer switch, so it can be fed off of an A plant or the B plant. So all of that needs to also be included. The other thing is that once the training is completed, um, it needs to be editable so that it can be improved, it can be uh, revised as the plant evolves. So if you add systems or add chillers or you replace chillers or whatever, you need to be able to go out and update your, chill, your training program. And then it can also be given to new hires or, or when people rotate out or, you, you, or whatever, so that that training is available for uh, giving to, to people either as, um, as new hires or for remedial training when somebody's made a mistake or, or, or is confused, or, or just for, for routine um, recertification of staff uh, as needed. Okay, uh, so I'll move on to the next question. Uh, what happens if the commissioning process fails in the validation stage? If the commissioning process fails in the validation stage, well, you have a bad outcome. <laughs> um, so let me first start by saying that commissioning is not performed by a commissioning provider. The commissioning is led, facilitated, and managed by the commissioning provider over a team. And that team is made up of the main stakeholders in the project. So the commissioning team should include uh, the owner's representatives. It should include, which would be your facility management group typically. It should include the engineer of record and the architects who, who have the, the knowledge of what the intent is of the requirements and specifications. They establish what the acceptance criteria are. They're the ones who actually define how the equipment needs to operate, et cetera. You need the general contractor included because he's actually building it. He's the one who has to demonstrate compliance with the construction drawings through submittals, through inspections, through uh, passing the acceptance testing, et cetera. You need the subcontractors because they built it and they're instrumental in the startup and, and making sure that it works and resolving any discrepancies and problems. And you also need the, um, in some cases, the major vendors and suppliers like the chiller manufacturer or the generator manufacturer. They should be present during the startup and testing of their equipment, et cetera. So there's an entire team of people who are involved in performing commissioning and it's led by the commissioning provider. Um, I will say that no process is absolutely infallible or um, can't have, can't miss something. So things do happen. Um, and the point of commissioning is to minimize that, to capture as much in advance as possible, um, et cetera. If, the commissioning process literally fails. That would mean that the building has been turned over uh, as complete. And then during operation, the plant fails or some anomaly occurs that shows that it was not properly verified and tested uh, in, in the construction phase during the project. Uh, and so bad things happen. Um, and, and, and an example, uh, 
let me think of one. Um, I, I've had a, a system where um, a, an employee of mine actually um, claimed that he'd done all of the testing on a domestic water system and had uh, storage tanks, et cetera, and he hadn't tested it. And the building had a water outage. Uh, it, it, this water was necessary because it was a command center for a utility, so they, they couldn't vacate the building. Uh, and suddenly they didn't have water for the restrooms, for the cafeteria, for, 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 for sinks, et cetera, uh, because the system, water storage system didn't work. And, and I went out and looked at it and, and it could not work. It didn't have a vacuum breaker on the tank. So it didn't matter. It, there was no way it could have been tested. And yet my, my persons claimed that he had tested it and it passed and everything was done. So our, um, I took the blame for it. I told the client it was our fault because we were the commissioning agent. We were the one who said that it was tested and it wasn't. So it was my fault. But I also pointed out that my script had been vetted across all of the people from, from his facilities management group, the installing contractors, the engineer, everybody looked at the script and said it was correct. And there was no way the script could have worked because the way the system was designed. So in actuality, it was the entire team that failed and, and that was a process failure within the commissioning process itself. And in this case, it resulted in an impact to the building. Okay. Uh, so we have the next question. I think so this was uh, covered in presentation, but I'll just like you to summarize it a little bit. Uh, it's how can we create a balance between complexity, efficiency and reliability? Ah, that's a difficult question. Uh, well, it's a, it may be a simple question. It's a difficult answer. Um, so what I would say is if there's 100 settings in a piece of equipment, then somebody should go through that 100 settings for your specific application and should check each one and define that. Uh, that should be done by uh the manufacturer who's telling you that that piece of equipment is suitable for what you're trying to get done and then verified by the engineer of record and the commissioning agent that it is appropriate for what you're trying to do um, this usually doesn't occur we get a submittal that has all the capabilities and tells you what kind of controller but it doesn't go through a list of all the settings etc uh, another one is uh, variable frequency drives. Uh, they're famous for having lots and lots of settings, and, and the vast majority are usually left in the factory default without a problem. Uh, but in some cases, uh, you set them up incorrectly and you can have a problem. I've seen, for instance, uh, where the ramp up rate on a large air handler unit fan was so quickly it didn't allow the VAV boxes the opportunity to open their dampers. Uh, so the pressure, the duct overpressurized and it blew, blew the main duct up. It, blew, it just overpressurized it and blew it up at the seams, et cetera. That's in a setting. It could have easily been avoided if somebody had gone through each of the settings and, and consciously picked good, good values and set it up appropriately. Um, when it comes to matching the complexity of what you're buying to the staff, et cetera, is, is First of all, you have to know what the staff is. So if you haven't defined those in the beginning, like I said, in the programming phase where you actually identify who, who will be your, your operating staff, uh, what, where are they coming from? Are they, are they coming from other sites where they're familiar with all the gear and they've been trained on everything and they're very experienced and they can accept a higher level of sophistication and, and uh, complexity. If, if it's brand new staff who, who maybe have very limited experience running uh, any building or are now being asked to operate a, a critical building, then you want to ensure that either you use simple uh, and, and, and easy to understand strategies and, and technology or that you have very thorough training and certification on your staff to, to bridge the gap, to get them to the point where they can manage and, and handle that type of complexity. Okay, I hope this is the best possible answer for this. I, I'll move on to the next question, sir. Uh, what are the differences 
while you are working on design of critical facilities operations and maintenance for a it company compared to a manufacturing industry uh, i'd say the process is the same um, and i would say the processes that i described today can be used or deployed on any type of facility, a laboratory, commercial office building, school, you name it. Um, the difference would be to the extent of detail and effort uh, and resources that you're going to apply. Uh, so you can have a very basic maintenance program for easy equipment for, for standard buildings without having to go through all of the, the efforts that you would for a highly complex building. For an IT building, for a data center, um, the most important aspect is, of course, maintaining the computer's uh, operations. Um, and so uh, you need to ensure that the IT department is working in collaboration with the facilities management department and that they understand their mutual dependencies on each other. That would be a similar challenge for a manufacturing facility or an assembly uh, plant or um, for whatever, uh, but you would have to adapt that training and culture uh, accordingly between the two different industries, et cetera. Um, in general, though, I don't see a whole lot of difference. Uh, if you're talking about a, for instance, um, a, a plastics company with extrusions and they're, they're, they're pushing, you know, liquid plastic through pipes. And if they, if they lose the, the, the heating or whatever, or the pumps, then those pipes just turn into rods because that plastic will harden up. Well, that's a seven by 24. You have to keep that running all the time. It's mission critical. So a lot of the processes that we discussed should apply to that. Um, other industries that are mission critical hospitals, for instance, uh, they have a lot of the same infrastructure as a data center. They have emergency generators. They have paralleling switch gear. They have um, redundant equipment. They run seven by 24 forever. Uh, their mission is life safety. Uh, so um, it, they have the UPS units, et cetera. So it, it's very similar topologies and architecture and requirements, but the mission is completely different. So I'm not sure if, if, if I've answered the question fully, but I, in my mind, there's not a whole lot of difference. Uh, it's not like you, you change processes. The process, the thought process, the, the steps that need to occur uh, are, are the same, but some of the answers might come out to be a little bit different. Uh, okay, so we have one last question in the uh, chat box, and that is, what is the most challenging part in commissioning out of programming, designing, construction, testing, documentation, or training? Which of those phases are the most challenging? Sir. Um, I would say that, I, uh, okay, well, first of all, Rather than challenging, let me let me s s change it for a second to be where is the most value added, um, and that would be in the programming and design phase, believe it or not, because that's where we identify and resolve problems and we define what the issues and challenges and objectives are before we've actually started spending money on buying equipment and building things once you get to the point where you've started to build things then when you start to make design or or programming changes it has a much greater impact not only on the schedule and on the budget but on the, the quality you, you end up having to make compromises or you have to adapt what you've built for some different use etc so a lot of the value of commissioning occurs up front in in the programming and design phase uh, and then you're verifying that it gets accomplished during the construction and then you make sure it gets transitioned over to facilities management at the end of the job from a challenge, um, especially with data centers, 
the acceptance testing can be quite challenging. Um, and part of the reason for that is that we, we are not only looking at verifying that the systems and equipment operate and perform correctly, but we're also verifying that when they fail, they fail correctly, meaning that if, if a chiller fails, that a redundant chiller is automatically started, brought onto operation and works. Uh, if a pump fails, that the redundant pump starts, et cetera. And part of the challenge is being able to script the appropriate tests to verify the failures. And an example would be, how, how can you, how do you sense that a pump has failed? Well, if you have, if you're looking at the amps on the motor, then if you, if you have no current, then you know the motor's not running. So that would tell you the motor's failed. But what if the motor is running, but the coupling is broke? You still have a sense that the motor's running, but the pump is not moving any water anymore, et cetera. So you have to actually think through the failure scenarios and all the ways that things can fail and whether they're being monitored correctly and, and how the system will react given a, a set, of, set of circumstances or, or, or um, initiating conditions. And so that can be challenging. Another thing I find very challenging is the, uh, the training and the documentation. And that's because historically, these things have been overlooked as part of the construction of the building where the focus is on the engineering and on the construction and on purchasing the right equipment and, and sizing and capacities. And, and the focus of the project team is to build it, uh, test it, and then close the project, get paid and leave. Uh, there's not enough attention uh, put into the training and the documentation, which is absolutely critical. Uh, and from a commissioning provider, that's where we have trouble because it's hard to get it programmed in at the program level. It's hard to get people to include this effort in the specifications. If it's not in the specifications, then it's hard to get it accomplished during the construction. And, and often people would start claiming they need extra money, uh, change order because it wasn't in their scope. And now the project's already run out of money. It's at the end of the job. Uh, people just want to get done and get out. And, and so these things don't necessarily get the attention or the effort that they deserve. Uh, and, and so um, from a commissioning provider who's tasked with ensuring that the project gets fully documented and the training and, and, and the processes get in place for the facilities management group, that that's often a, a great challenge as well. Uh, another challenge is in the acceptance testing is that uh, if you think about a typical construction project, there's always a little delay here, and then there's a, a delay there, and then the schedule starts to, to slip a little bit, and then the owner is claiming, I need this building, and they start to expedite their work or whatever. And as far as the schedule goes, they end up compressing that, that commissioning, that acceptance testing phase. So everybody's expecting everything's gonna work right the first time, and we're gonna get it done in two weeks, and we're gonna be done and out of here. And then when you get to the actual acceptance testing, there's actually three or four weeks worth of work or more. Um, you start to test things and they fail. They weren't, they weren't installed properly or, or something happens. Uh, and the schedule doesn't carry contingency time for you to go back and, and resolve the problems. And so all of a sudden uh, you're, you're delaying the project and everybody's under a lot of pressure uh, and you're being trust to, to compromise or, or to expedite or, or to combine testing, et cetera. And, and as a commissioning agent, you have to push back and you have to insist that we have to follow the process, we have to be thorough, uh, and, and it's absolutely critical or else we all run the risk of having a, an outage or a building fail uh, after we've all left and it's under operation and there's a mission in So, so this was the last question, sir, and uh, thank you, sir, for a very quick response to all the questions. And uh, thank you from my side, uh, Mr. Terry. Actually, it was really a very, very good learning session for all of us. 
and I'm sure all the students and the teachers who have attended this have gained a lot from your talk. And now we are in a position to understand this uh, design principles and the best best practices in design. I think uh, this has been quite clear. Uh, thanks to all the attendees who are here. And uh, Mr. Terry has uh, already shared that number, his email ID. So I'm sure that few people will be con contacting with him. And thank you. Thanks to all of you, all the attendees, and thanks to Mr. Terry. Thank you so much. Okay, um, one thing I'd like to add is that I'll provide you the, the, the presentation so you can post it on your website, make it available for your, your attendees to, to reference in the future. I welcome any, uh, any inquiries that you might have. Again, I thank you all for, for allowing me this opportunity and uh, namaste. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.